right, I'll get started today with uh, the scripture passage. If you want to turn to it, it's going to be in Luke 24. But I got only two, only one quote slide here and one other first slide outside of the scripture today. So things are going to be a little bit different than I usually do it. This may be hard for you to read, so I'm going to read it. It says, if one refuses to believe in the possibility of miraculous occurrences altogether, the resurrection will seem an absurdity. But large numbers of modern scientific people recognize that science itself is merely descriptive rather than prescriptive. If a God exists, it is only natural to expect him to have powers beyond that which science has discovered or can explain and to be able to use them for his purposes. It is arguable that of all the alleged miracles in ancient history, the resurrection is actually the one with far and away the most historical support. We have more about Jesus in history written than any other character in history. Uh, we watched that uh, Truth Project a few weeks ago and it pointed out, it said, asked the person, said, do you believe Plato ever existed? And they were like, yeah. And they were like, you know, there's hardly anything written about Plato. But about Jesus, there's been more things written than anybody else. And if we go back into history and to documented writings, we have writings that from, uh, from right close to within 20 years of the time that Jesus was on the earth, we have writings still. And yet, all these other guys, it was thousands of years later, it's the most recent writing copy we have of those guys existing. And besides that, of all of these major events, historical things we have in history, we have over 24,000 historical documents all about Jesus, about the Word of God, that have always been kept, never been thrown away, never been destroyed. We can look at all of them and see that it's no lie, it's the truth. And as uh, just this week, I did a Bible study with my friend Nick, and we, and we were looking at Genesis 1. And a lot of people will try to destroy the foundations of the Word of God and say, well, it didn't really happen in six days. Let me tell you how it was all these things. Well, the Word of God says it happened in six days. And if you can't believe what the Word of God says about the foundations, how are you to believe something that a man rises from the dead in bodily form? How are you to believe all these miracles that Jesus did? God is capable of the supernatural, and He does not operate in the restricted realm in which we live. So this resurrection of Christ, many, many churches that are bad churches don't believe in a bodily resurrection of Christ. That's it. There's, there's churches like Jehovah Witness or different one that believe it was just like a spiritual essence, like a, like a guy you maybe pass your hand through or something. But if you're a believer, you must believe that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. He was, we're, we can look through the, through the scriptures and see Jesus could walk through a door and appear in a room with a locked door. But yet, they were able to touch his hands. They would put their hands in his sides. They, he was able to take food and eat it. He ate fish. You know, the people that are all against vegetarian stuff, he, he wasn't a vegetarian. <laughs> he ate fish. He, he, he drank wine. He did these things right in front of all the people right there, and they could see that he was a real body, a real person, risen from the dead. The resurrection is, is probably the, the greatest tale of Christianity because it shows everything that Jesus said came to pass. Jesus over and over said, I'm going to die and rise again the third day. And people just didn't get it. They weren't catching on. And that day, from the Old Testament scripture, they were looking. They knew that the Messiah would come one day, that he would be able to be the final sacrifice for everyone. He'd be able to save the world, but they also thought that he would also rule the world at that time. Little did they know, it would be thousands of years later, and we haven't yet, yet reached that time when Christ will come back and rule all things, when the last day will come upon us. But here in this passage, we have some great stuff right here. And I have one more thing I want to show you before we get into the scripture readings. And this is uh, Luke 10, 22. It's that alluded to when we pray, and this alludes to in this scripture passage as well. We need to tune in our ears and focus as closely as we can to the scripture, because the truth is within the scripture. And it says, in Luke 10, 22, it says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. Or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So we're going to see two guys on the road to Emmaus. They were going on the road to Emmaus. A seven-mile walk is what these guys walked with Jesus. And we're going to see this story played out, this narrative, probably the, the greatest narrative in the Bible, as Jesus has revealed himself to these two guys who wrote to Emmaus, 
who were already his disciples. They weren't apostles, but they were his disciples. And he's going to reveal himself to them on this road. And I'm going to do something different than I usually do today. I hope everybody's okay with it. There's only 16 scriptures, maybe 17. But I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to read the scripture together. Okay? And I have like two to three verses up, so everybody should be able to read it. If you can't, well, just try to follow along there. But if everybody please stand up. Most of them, this is a little bit smaller. Most of them are a little bit bigger print thing. It says, let's read it together. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. All right, you may uh, sit down. Okay? That'll be it for the, for the PowerPoints today. I have the rest right here in my body. Okay? <laughs> Thanks so much. I know there was kind of a lot to stand up and say, but I appreciate you guys standing up and uh, reading with me. I think that's good that we stand up and honor the Word of God when we read it. That's a good practice that uh, I think is a great thing. But here, we're going to be talking today about the resurrection, like I said. All right? And it's probably the one of the most moving narratives of the New Testament about this, uh, what happened. All right? So we start in verse 13. We just read, it says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking, discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing them. Okay, so they weren't able to see that this was Jesus. These were disciples of Jesus. These, people, these were people who believed in Jesus. Remember, for three years, Jesus had preached. Jesus had his ministry in Jerusalem. And they, people had followed him. Every, just this week before, Jesus had come in on the donkey, and like two million people had cried out, Hosanna in the highest, praise the Lord. They were like, 
Praise God, the Messiah is here. And they were laying down their coats. They were laying down palm branches. And then just five days later, they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, led on by the religious leaders of the day. And, uh, you know, yes, it was the Romans who executed Jesus, but it was the Israel people, the Jews, God's own people, who sent him to the cross, who went to the Romans and demanded that he be put to death. Remember, the Romans even tried to hand over uh, Jesus to be free so they could kill this murderer, Barabbas, who had started up these uprisings and uh, like a crazy uh, uh, anarchy type of fellow right there. And yet they wanted Barabbas, this crazy guy, to live with them rather than Jesus. So here we see they're talking about it, and they don't even recognize Jesus as he comes to them. And there's a purpose for this. You know, Jesus, when we read about his resurrected, glorified body in the book of Revelation... It talks about the, the light from him, that there's not even a sun that's needed, that his radiance is the light thereof. And there's never night in the end kingdom that will come one day. And then uh, just imagine the, the brilliance, the radiancy of his light, that nowhere will any light be needed, no sun be needed. But yet he can also be just like we are, and walk like us, and look like us, and not be any, any different if he chooses to be. And this is how he chose to be as he came across these fellows. And he says to them, in verse 17, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Now they were brokenhearted. They thought this was the Messiah. Remember, from everything that they had heard, this was the guy who was going to free them all. Man, they, the Israel people, even though they had some bit of authority there, and they had their temple and things, they were still under Roman rule. I mean, they weren't totally free. It wasn't their way. They still had to pay their taxes to the Romans. They felt, they felt uh, under the hand of the Romans. They felt the oppression from the Romans. And they thought their Messiah was going to set them free. And it would be just like we look at the last day when the kingdom comes. But here, these guys are brokenhearted. They're sad. It says in verse 18, Then one of them named Cleopas, which is the, the man's name of Cleopatra. Okay, so this guy was, you know, you know he's, he's uh, given a name. It was probably from a, a pagan type culture, but now he's a disciple. He answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Because remember, there's been a lot of stuff going on, okay? The Passover was celebrated, okay? Two million some people were there. You know, Jesus was crucified. This was a huge event that happened this week. All kinds of their holy holidays are going on, and during the holy holidays, the Christ was crucified, whom they all had been following. So these guys are broken, they're crushed. And here's this stranger just comes up along on the road and says, Hey, what are you guys talking about? And he, they said to him, What? You don't even know what's going on? Where, where, where have you been? All right? So then, they, then the, it says here, it says in verse 19, And he said to them, which is Jesus, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word before God and all the people. Now this is kind of like some humor. Can you imagine Jesus coming along with him and he says, What things? What are you talking about here? Jesus knew exactly what happened because it happened to him. He was the risen Christ. And yet these guys walking along, he says to him, What things? What, what things happened here? He wants to hear, what do they have to say about it? What is their perspective? Where, where are they at right now? And, uh, and he has his purpose behind all this. So it's kind of like some humor. Just imagine Jesus saying, What things? You know? He knows everything that happened. He wasn't just a stranger who was walking by. And uh, it says here, it says, And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. So these guys knew. They didn't blame the Romans. They blamed the chief priests and the rulers. But yet, the crowd, which were the same people that were yelling Hosanna, praise him, they went right along with what the chief priests and rulers said. I mean, the, the, there were tons of Israel Jewish people. It wasn't like a crowd of Romans that was standing there demanding Jesus' crucifixion. It was his own people. Okay? So they were easily influenced by, by the leaders of the day and different things rather than Christ himself. Alright? <coughs> but these guys, they don't, put the, they don't put the blame on the Romans. They, they rightly justified that it was on his own people. It says in verse 21, But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things had happened. So obviously... They didn't believe the testimony of the women, all right? We're about to talk about that. But in that day, women were not in, a, in any kind of equal setting whatsoever. Okay? Women were, were held in a low place in society. And yet, as surprisingly enough, 
Jesus reveals himself to the women first. Okay, There were several women that saw Jesus before anybody else saw Jesus. The first people that saw Jesus resurrected were the women at the tomb. When they came and the angel said, he is risen, he is not here. Just read the first 12 verses of 24 and it talks about that. But the women had already given testimony and these guys didn't believe the women. It says, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that, that he was mine. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him... They did not see, okay? So they went to the tomb, they didn't see him, they said, was wow, it really is an empty tomb, but then they didn't see, the, they didn't see Jesus. And they, so these guys are, are basically not believing, all right? And why are they not believing? Because according to everything they'd heard preached, probably in their temple, to the <coughs> scripture that they had read, it was all about victory. It was all about greatness. It wasn't about the suffering Messiah, all right? And I thought... How much is that just like today? So many places, all we hear is about how great life will be if you're a Christian, and how you'll get healed, and you'll get wealthy, all these things. And those things it doesn't talk about anywhere in the Bible at all, okay? Those aren't things that you come to be a Christian for. And yet they're the things that people gravitate to and grab onto. And there are a lot of great positive verses in the Bible that says how God will bless us, how He'll lead us, how good things will happen to those who believe. But it doesn't necessarily mean good things by what the world standard is of good things, okay? If you look at all these disciples, the, the apostles, every one of them was tortured and murdered for the name of Christ, okay? And there was, uh, even Jesus said he had no place to even lay his head. He wasn't some rich guy walking around having everything that he had. If you look at the book of Job, Job suffered, had ten of his children killed by the authority of God allowing the devil to do that. And at the end of the book, and had this terrible disease from head to toe, had everything taken away from what, what, everything, and yet we never know why God allowed Job to do that, why God allowed the devil to do that. God offered Job up to the devil. It wasn't like this just happened. To you know, there was a meeting of the sons of God, and the devil was there too, and he said to him, have you considered my servant Job? You know, God threw Job underneath the bus. You know, he's like, hey, here you go, Satan. What are you going to do with my servant Job? Let's, let's see what you can do with him. And yet at the end of it all, the only thing that happened to Job was God rebuked him for questioning him. He told Job, he goes, were you there when I made the heavens? Were you there when I made the earth and all these things? Were you there? Can you, can you draw the Leviathan like the, the, the dinosaur creature out of the sea, you know, with a finger like a hook in his mouth right there? Could you do all these things? And, and he humbled Job, and Job's like, no. And at the end, though, he also did praise Job that Job kept on and did not give up. And that's who each one of us has to be as well, okay? We need to believe, we need to keep on and keep following. And these disciples here were all about, wow, the kingdom's coming. We're not going to be under Roman oppression anymore. Great things are going to be. They were looking forward to it. And it didn't happen the way they expected it to happen. They were sorrowful. They were downtrodden. They're walking along this road. And here Jesus comes along. And says, what, what things? What things happened recently? And they're like, what? And they start to explain it. And they tell him what, what, what they have seen. What's their perspective, all right? And then I have some, some notes here, too, before I get into this next passage, all right? And uh, think about this. The apostles could not have invented the resurrection. This wasn't just a story that was made up. It even includes in one of the Gospels here that, that the... Uh, that the Romans were paid money, the guards were, to say that they fell asleep and the apostles came and stole the body away from the tomb. It even records that. I mean, if you were writing a book trying to convince people that this is what happened, would you have written that in your book? You know, saying, well, here, this is planned. Pay, uh, pay, we're, these guys were paid to say the apostles stole his body, right? In fact, in the beginning, the apostles weren't even sure either. They're all downtrodden themselves up here, waiting out in Jerusalem at like a hideout spot, not knowing what to do, totally discouraged, all just scattered across, okay? Jesus is going to make appearances to them as well, all right? But at this time, the apostles weren't even the ones that were standing by, okay? Everybody, nobody had really gotten it. And if you read through the scripture, through the gospels, Jesus repeatedly says, 
I will die, and in three days I will rise again. He gives all these illusions to that. He says it straight out right to him. He even stops Peter in the garden when Peter tries to chop the guy's head off, and the guy moves, and he chops the guy's ear off right there, and he says, stops him. He even calls him, he even says, Satan, get behind me. You know, this is what my lot is to be, and no one is to change it. This is where I'm destined to be. This is the way it's always been planned to be, and this will happen. It will happen exactly, actually it happened on the exact same day that over 500 years before it had been prophesied to happen on that Passover day. But here we see, we see that even the apostles did it. So they didn't invent this, okay? They were lost in hope, hope they were in despair. And uh, then we can also see here that uh, as, we, as we get into this next passage here, that the greatest service that we can do for anybody on this earth, above all things, is to help them to understand the Scripture. Because that's what's so powerful about this passage. Jesus is about to explain to them all the Old Testament Scripture that talks about what he was about to be. If I have a friend, Phil, Phil became a Christian, he said, alone from looking at all these Old Testament prophecies, you know, written from uh, 1500 B.C., you know, hundreds and hundreds of years before, that were fulfilled in Christ, that happened, that came about and came to be. And that's the greatest thing any of us can do, is to help somebody understand the Scripture, spend the time with them, and bring them to the Bible, and let them see it for themselves. And uh, the reason that they didn't believe the Scriptures is because they only had a partial understanding of the Scriptures, okay? And all these verses, like Isaiah 53, and different ones I'm going to mention them, it's like they didn't grab that stuff. They didn't preach that stuff, probably, in the synagogue. They didn't... They didn't mention that stuff. In fact, today in the Jewish community, I can't wait till the next Jewish guy I run across, is I'm going to read him Isaiah 53 if he'll give me the time of day. Because if you talk to the Jews today, that is like a deleted book. It's like the lost book in the book of Isaiah. The Jews hold to the book of Isaiah, but yet Isaiah 53 is never preached from in their churches. It's never mentioned. Because if you read Isaiah 53, you will read the exact description of what happened to Jesus on the cross and why he died for us. And, and, it, and it fits too perfectly for him. So I can't wait to read it to the next Jewish guy I run across right there. But it's just like this was the popular view. What, what, it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was not a true faith, okay? And remember, they yelled, they yelled crucify him and everything. So the popular view wasn't true faith. True faith is no matter what, we believe and we stand in Christ. No matter what happens to us. Even if the worst things in life come upon us, we still stand in Christ. That's a sign of true faith. Without that, we don't have true faith. It says in the Bible that he that endures to the end shall be saved. If we don't have a persevering, enduring faith that goes through the hard times, that goes through the trouble that brings us through, we don't have any real faith at all. We're just looking for some psychological fix, some kind of an Oprah Winfrey soap opera show or something. And that's not about that. It's Everything is about Christ, and we're dedicating ourselves to Him. And they did not have enough enough understanding of the Scripture. Okay, This is probably the, the biggest thing we need to know, is we need to know Christ crucified. Uh, Paul said that when he talked in Corinthians. He said, the only thing I want to know among you is Christ crucified. You know, I want to know that you know He was crucified, that He paid for your sins, that He was a substitute for you. I want to know that you know who Jesus is. And, uh, and so we can, we can, we'll go into this passage here. Verse 25 says, And He said to them, O oh, foolish ones. So He starts off with a rebuke. And I like this too, because I study a lot of stuff about preaching all the time. It says the first thing we should do when we preach is rebuke the people. It says that in Timothy 4.2. It says we should rebuke, reprove, and then exhort. Then encourage right there. Okay, It's not a thing. We're not supposed to just make everybody feel good. Preachers shouldn't be, you know, everybody always goes there and they feel all fluffy when they leave out of there. Actually, when you leave church, every time you leave church, you should have some kind of sense of, 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 uh, Response, some kind of response to the scripture that I want to be different, that I want to, I've heard that from the word of God and I want to change and be like the word of God. I want to follow God. I want to obey him more. That's the way we should be feeling as we leave out of church. But Jesus says, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There's a big exclamation mark right there, okay? So he's, he's like, yelling at him, and he rose his voice and he let him know. So before he's just a stranger walking around, and now he's calling him a bunch of foolish ones, slow of heart to believe, everything the prophets have spoken. He says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Imagine that. That's a, that's a sermon that I, I would pay a lot of money for to hear that sermon right there, okay? Imagine if you were there hearing Jesus himself expositing Scripture, you know, bringing it out to light, bringing the Scriptures from the Old Testament, revealing everything that was said about himself on this seven-mile walk, which probably took quite a long time, figure what, at least two or three hours, right? And it was this, on a Sunday evening. It was in the evening, you know, getting toward the end of the day on that Sunday. And uh, here he is, and he starts explaining out of all the Old Testament, all these scriptures concerning himself. Now, I have some notes here. I'm not going to read all of them, but there are some good notes right here. All right, about some of these scriptures that he could have been explaining to them, okay? This is just some. We don't know exactly what scriptures he was explaining to them, but I can show you that they say there's like 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. We're just going to mention a few of those, okay? He might have started in Genesis 3.15. That's where the curse is being handed out. The curse that broke this world and brought us to the broken world that we live in today from that sin of Adam and Eve, taking that, taking that fruit and eating it. But in, that, in Genesis 3.15, he might have told them, Do you not know that I am the wounded seed of the woman who crushes the serpent's head? He might have stayed in Genesis 3 and said, I am the true and only covering for the sinner's guilt, pictured in the covering of the skins provided by God at the price of death of an innocent substitute. Remember that? when After they sinned, I mean, they were stark naked in the garden. There was no sin. There was no shame. After they sinned, they were hiding from God, trying to tie fig leaves and things around them right there. And when God found them and found out the whole sin, God killed the first animal. Before that, if you read in Genesis 1, verse 29, all they ate was, was vegetables, was fruits. Every green plant was good for everything. It doesn't say anything about anybody eating anything but plants until after the fall. So there was no death. Okay, It says in the Bible, the wages of sin is death. That's why I can't, I can't believe anything but a young earth in six days because, because the first sin brought the death. If there were deaths for millions and millions and millions of years, to me, it, it, it weakens the gospel. It brings it all up because sin came, be, uh, death came because of sin. Brokenness in our world, everything came because of sin. The curse came and we were cursed, and everything was broken because of sin. And God killed that first animal to cover their shame. Just like, like, it was like to, the, to the future thing, when Jesus was killed, His blood covers our shame. His blood covers our guilt. His blood covers our sin. That when the Father sees us one day, He'll look at us and He'll see us as white as snow. No matter how many sins we've done, no matter how bad we've been, no matter what's happened in this life, why? Because of everything that Jesus did on the cross that day when he died and paid the price for all of our sins. And he might have gone to chapter 4 of Genesis and said, The one sacrifice God will accept in the way he accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's is me. Remember the story of Abel and Cain? Abel was the one who, uh, who, who killed, the, uh, killed the animal and brought it to them because God demands death for sin, for a sacrifice. He demands he demands, he wants to show us that our sin brings death. Our sin brings things that are dead. Animals have to die in order to represent the guilt that we should feel for our own sin. And that's what would happen. And yet, Cain, being the gardener that he was, brought his best fruits and vegetables, but he was told by God, that's, that's no good. It's worthless. And God brought the best of his stuff. And then God even tried to counsel him. He told him, he said, be careful. Sin is crouching at your door. You must master. In the next verse, he gets up and he kills his brother Abel. All right, and then Cain gets cursed from God. But here we see that you know that that, that sacrifice demanded, and the acceptable sacrifice is that. And uh, we can also see probably he went to Genesis six through eight and recounted the history of the flood. And as Peter does, he said, "I am the true ark of safety into which sinners enter and sail through the waters of divine judgment." All right, so it says that in the book of Peter, and it can picture us like with the flood when the flood came. Every single person on earth died. It was mass devastation like this world has never seen and will see again until the end of time comes. But only, only eight people survived. Everybody on the whole earth was killed by God in judgment for their sin. And, and Peter point, points out about Jesus that I am the true ark of safety into which sinners enter and sail through the waters of divine judgment. You know, the only way we're getting on that boat and floating free is by believing in Jesus Christ and Him being our Lord and our Savior. And surely he went to Genesis 8, 20 and 22 and described the altar built there by Noah and the sacrifice offered and said, that sacrifice offered after the judgment against the world is a picture of my sacrifice. All right? And after that, they had a sacrifice. And once again, it shows 
this what was going to happen. In fact, if you look in Hebrews, I think it's 10, 14, it says that none of these animal sacrifices forgave any sins. Millions of animals were slaughtered, hundreds of thousands sometimes in some of these events, had to die for the people's sin to, to let them know how bad sin is, and yet it didn't even take away their sins. Okay, All those innocent animals, dead because of the people's sin. It wasn't until Jesus came that he was the ultimate and final sacrifice. It says that in Hebrews 10 also, that he was the one and last sacrifice. He completed it all. And we see here, and he... We can see that he probably stopped at Genesis 22 and reminded them of the story of Isaac, who was to be offered as a sacrifice on the altar and was a willing sacrifice, which is, in a sense, a picture of Christ. Remember, Isaac's with his dad. He's the, the, the miracle child of a hundred-year-old man right there. And he's everything that, that Abraham had. And God said, go kill your son. And he goes with his son. His son goes with him willingly. And when his son realizes that there's no ram, he willingly gets on the altar as well. They were obedient to God all the way to the point of death. And then God stopped him when he was about to thrust the knife through his son and kill his son and stopped him. And he provided another sacrifice, a ram caught in a thicket for him. But with God the Father, he did not stop with his own son. And he brought him to the altar and had him crushed for our iniquities, as it says in Isaiah 53. So we can, we can look at this, and maybe he pointed this out to him as well. And, uh, and I'm sure he must have gone to Exodus 12 and said, Don't you remember the Passover lamb? The Passover lamb had to be without blemish and without spot. And if the blood was shed and splattered on the doorpost and the side beams, the angel of death would pass by that house. I am the true Passover lamb who protects the sinner from divine judgment. Perhaps that's what Jesus said. Because if you remember, the tenth and final curse that came upon the Egyptians with Pharaoh was he God killed the firstborn of every single person and every single animal. So there were dead animals and dead people everywhere. Even Pharaoh's own son in the royal divine household was killed by God. He only do for us. And he probably went to Exodus 16, which is the story of God providing manna. They told him that he was the true manna from heaven. He says that in John 6. I think he went to Leviticus, still in the writings of Moses, the first seven chapters. There are five main offerings there. There's the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, and the sin offering, and the guilt offering. All right, look in Leviticus. It's a book of some serious bloodshed and different things going on and rules. But he... But then it says, and I think he showed that he is the fulfillment of each of those offerings. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that he is the true offering superior to all others. I think in the Pentateuch, every reference to the Day of Atonement pictured him, and he made it clear that he was the not only the sacrifice on the altar, but he was the scapegoat who took away sin. I think he probably went to Exodus 17, Numbers 20, and said he is the true rock to be smitten once in death to release the water of life. I think he might have stopped in Deuteronomy 18.15 and said, I am the prophet like unto Moses who is to come. He probably went to Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23 and said, I am the one who hanged on a tree, cursed by God, and taken down and buried before sundown. Surely he spent some time in Psalm 22. He is the one psalmist here is when the psalm begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And none of us will ever feel the forsakenness of God as Jesus felt the forsakenness of God that day. When he had the sins of the world all the way back from Genesis 3.15 to the last person to ever live on the earth held on him on that cross that day. And you remember, Jesus is God. Remember it says in Colossians, in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it says in, the, in Colossians and elsewhere, in Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus created all things. That nothing was created without him. He's the creator. The creator of the universe is now dying, and yet he was forsaken from, from the one who he's always been one with forever because all of the sin was just poured upon him that day that he paid the price for it. And he was the only one that was able to pay the price for that. He did it in the space of three hours for the sins of the entire world. Surely, it says the very words he spoke on the cross, Psalm 22 says, he will be a reproach. He will be sneered at. His bones will be out of joint. His strength will be gone. His hands and feet will be pierced. His clothes will be divided up by lots as he dies. Details in Psalm 22, if you want to look at it. Perhaps Jesus took the two of them to Psalm 69, 21 and reminded them, reminded them of the Messiah's cry of thirst. Then he was given vinegar to drink. Maybe he went to Psalm 40, verse 7, which says, Behold, I come to the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. Which the writer of Hebrews says applies only to the Messiah. 
Perhaps he went to Isaiah 50, verse 6, and said, I am the one who gave his back to the smiters, his cheeks to those who plucked out his beard and covered his face with spit. Perhaps he went to Daniel 9 and reiterated to them the wonderful prophecy of the 69 weeks of years, 69 times 7, which added up to these years between the decree of Artaxes to rebuild the temple and the coming of the Messiah will be in 69 years. You calculate that, the very date when the 69th year is complete is Nisan, that's the month that the, was in the Hebrew calendar, Nisan 9, 30 AD, the day Jesus walked in Jerusalem on that Monday. Perhaps he went to Zechariah 12.10 and reminded them that Zechariah said, One day Israel would look on him whom they have pierced. Another great passage, especially talking to some Jehovah Witness or somebody who doesn't believe Jesus is God. The beginning of Zechariah 12 is talking about I, Jehovah God, and I'm talking. And then he says, without any kind of transitional point, when they look on him whom they have pierced, when they look on me, it points out that Jesus is Almighty God. And it says they were the ones who really did the piercing through the spear was in the Roman soldier's hands. Without question, you can look at it for me for a moment. They would have gone to Isaiah. Without question, perhaps Jesus would have begun in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold my servant. My servant is a technical identification of the Messiah throughout this section of Isaiah. Behold my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Isaiah said the magnificent, exalted Messiah would be marred more than any man. So imagine what Jesus looked like when he went to that cross. And then into chapter 53, where it says in verse 2, in the middle, he had no stateliness, form, or majesty that we should look upon him. This views him on the cross. His appearance would not have attracted us to him. He was despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. All speaking of my servant, the Messiah. Despised, we didn't esteem him. What's he doing? Surely our griefs see himself bore. He's bearing our griefs, our sorrows he carried. He is stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Chastening for our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. There's not one person on the earth that's going to go to heaven because they're a good person. That's a great way to start off when you're talking to somebody. They say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. Well, how are you getting to heaven? Because I'm a good person. Well, you know right away, they're missing the whole point. Okay? They missed it, and that's where you've got to share the gospel with them and what Jesus did for them, and that they need to put their faith and believe on him. It says, it's not mistakeable. My servant, the servant of Jehovah in the book of Isaiah, is the Messiah. The Messiah will come and be the final sacrifice. The Lord will cause the iniquity of all of us to fall on him. To fall on him. The end of the chapter, he will bear the sin of many, intercede for the transgressors. It was clear that the Messiah was going to die as the final sacrifice, the substitute. All right? And then I had a little bit more, but if you think about even the New Testament in the... Uh, in Philip, in the book of Acts chapter 8, Philip is going along, and there's this pagan fella coming along in his little chariot right there, and he happens to be reading the Bible. He happens to be reading the book of Isaiah, and he tells Philip, he goes, hey, wait, who is this talking about right here? And Philip's able to tell him, hey, that's Jesus is who that's talking about. And this book written 700 years before, that's Jesus who that's talking about. And the guy gets saved, gets baptized right there on the spot. But, uh, but we can see there's a ton of different things in the Old Testament that lead us to Christ. And that's a point. The two biggest points, I think, of this whole sermon that I'm preaching to you guys today is, one, Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, He's appearing to these people. We have all this history made that Jesus rose from the dead. And two, the Scriptures are alive. Where does Jesus take them for the answer? Back to the Scripture, to the Bible. If we miss this... We miss everything, all right? These guys he's talking to, they didn't have enough scripture, okay? They had some scripture. They didn't have enough to realize about the Messiah, about the most important truth of all. And yet Jesus is gracious and he's giving it to them here, all right? So we'll go back. We'll go back to this right here. And it says, in verse 28, it says, So they drew near the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. All right, so so he's like, I'm going to keep going. I'm like, no, no, please don't keep going, especially after that sermon. Imagine how powerful that sermon from from God Almighty to you would have been. Imagine what, how that would have affected you. All right, it would have been it would have been incredible. There'd been no sleepers during that time, right there. All right, it would have been amazing. And he says to him, it says, so he went to so he went in to stay with them. 
And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to him. So he broke the bread. And if you look at the, the customs back then, the guests, the visitor, didn't like grab the bread and break it. That was something that the people would do themselves for the visitor, okay? You wouldn't have somebody come in your house and go in your kitchen and start making, making the dinner for you, right? It wouldn't be like that. But this is what Jesus did. And he broke the bread. And made, and he made just different reasons why that happened. Maybe he's, he's reminding them of the last supper that had occurred and how his body would be broken. Maybe they were so enthralled with the, with the sermon, with the word of God that he just preached, that they lost their hunger. They were like, oh, man, they were just dying and thirsting for more of what they just heard. Who knows why? But we can see that's what happened. And it says here, it says, it says, and their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. So at this point, when Jesus breaks the bread, they see that he is Jesus. They're like, wow, God has come. He's right here among us. And all of a sudden, he just vanishes. And that's the way we're going to be one day. We're going to have glorified bodies like this as well. One day, we're going to have a body like that that can just disappear, appear, have all these different things, because we will be like him. It says that in the Bible. But we can see what he did. He just vanished. And imagine, imagine how many things, when they realized that was him in that last second, they were like, whoa, we were with the Lord. Imagine the things, well, I wish I would have asked him this. I wish I would have told him this. But it was just gone. That fast right there, okay? And think of the graciousness that Jesus did for him. Because here they were downtrodden. They were sorrowed. They were depressed. They didn't know what was going on. And yet he came to them. He loved them so much. That he explained to them everything that must happen. And they figured it all out. And then they saw it was him and he broke the bread in front of them. And then he just disappeared. And then it says what they did after this. It says, And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while, we talked, while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. Imagine that. Imagine that burning feeling. I mean, that like, whoa. I mean, just like a, like a clear reality of light. It's like kind of like living in some kind of dim darkness right there. And all of a sudden, a door is open. Maybe you're in a dungeon or something like that. Or it's all dark and it's damp and it's mildew. Maybe you have a spot of some weird light or something that comes in. And then all of a sudden, a light comes on and like hospital bright white lights shine and flash upon you. And you're like, whoa, and you're just astounded. That's how it would have been after they had heard these scriptures opened up to them from Jesus. Because they were in their dimness. They knew some scripture, but they didn't have the light of salvation to come to full salvation in him. Because they didn't know he was the Messiah. They, they were giving up. And yet God came, even when they were giving up, and showed him and opened things up for him. And it says, it says to him here, it says, it says, uh, and they rose that same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. So he'd already gone off and appeared to Peter. That's who Simon is in the Bible, it's Peter. So they're, and they're all excited about that. And these guys came in, and think about this, they went back to Jerusalem. If you start at the beginning of the story, they walked seven miles from Jerusalem to this little town of Emmaus. Man, these guys were so excited, they booked it all the way back to Jerusalem with eleven disciples. They... 14 miles in one day. For a military guy, it's pretty impressive right there. I mean, they were used to walking. It was a walking culture, but still, that's pretty impressive. And he says, he says, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You know, because as soon as he broke that bread, he appeared to them, and then he just vanished. Imagine how excited now the upper room is starting to get, okay, before we get to, before we, before we move on and we see all these other things that go on, but but how much power and excitement and everything's going on. And uh, I have a few other notes I want to share with you here. I wrote, we are accountable to know what Scripture teaches. They needed to know it all. Partial knowledge is disastrous. All right? If you look at the cults and all these crazy things, they only have like a little bits and pieces of the Scripture. In fact, I've seen it many times. Whenever I see Jehovah's Witnesses somewhere, I try to jump, grab my Bible, just get right over to them. And I want to talk to them. And as soon as I start talking to them, they're like, sorry, sir, we don't want to hear anything. We don't want anything to do with that. And they just try to run away from me. They don't want to hear the truth. They know that they fall short. Because other Christians have come along as well, different times, trying to show them the scripture. They can't answer it because they're trying to take certain select scriptures and make a whole false religion out of something that doesn't even exist and base their life on it. Okay, One, one guy told me, I don't know some guy here, but he told me, when they come to his door, they tell him they, they, they don't even believe in hell or anything. And he says to them, if there's no hell, why do I even need to be like you? Why do I need to go all these door to doors and act like you act if there's not even a hell? And they don't even have a question for that, okay? An answer. All right, to them it'd be like, because we hope one day to get to live on the earth in paradise. And, 
And it's just twisted, but they only have partial scripture. We need to dig deep. We need to love the word and search it. All right? And we've got to think about this too. This was a life defining, defining moment for these two guys. Imagine that. Imagine the rest of their lives, whoever they meet, they were probably like, hey, we met Jesus one day. He was resurrected by He walked with us seven miles and he told us this great sermon. Let me tell you what it was. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's written down in history somewhere. I've got to check and see somewhere if there's anybody who claims they had this sermon. But I'm sure these guys, for the rest of their lives, that's all they talked about. It's like I always tell people when I meet them, I try to greet them, meet them, try and attract them. And I tell them, like, remember that movie Somalia? And I was like, I was right there on the ground as a ranger. And that was a life defining moment for me. And I know some other guys who were there that, I mean, they still, everything they wear is ranger, 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 okay? But that's probably how these guys were. That was a life defining moment for them. Everything they said from there on out was probably that conversation went eventually to this story about Jesus walking with them on the road. All right? And a good teacher is like, Jesus was a good teacher, and he asked provocative questions. He drew things out, and he solicited self examination. All right? So that is the way a good teacher It's the way we ought to teach scripture. Is we ought to draw things out of the scripture, not put things into them. That's called eisegesis. Exegesis is we draw things out of the scripture, which really there, and then it should cause us to examine ourselves, to focus on ourselves and compare ourselves, measure ourselves against the Word of God. And I tell you, we will always be short of the Word of God. There's nobody here who's ever going to examine the scriptures and be like, oh, I'm real good right here. No, none of us. We're all going to be short. But by the grace of God and by the free gift of mercy and grace that God's given us, we have salvation because of what Jesus has done. But this will continually make us better and help us there. And what's a way that we could do this? Is we can keep coming to church every week. Hearing the Word of God. Okay, many of you come to church every week, some may not. But it's something that we ought to do. It says in Hebrews 10, 25, we shall not forsake the gathering together of the saints. It's something that we should do. We should stay accountable. We should stay as part of the body of Christ. Move together. And what else should we do? Is we should be daily living in the Word of God. It's not enough just to come to church once a week. It's something that has to be a daily walk relationship. It's something every day we choose. This is the Lord I serve. You know, in, the, in the Old Testament it says, choose this day whom you will serve. It's a choice every single day. Today I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to walk after Him. All right? And uh, those, were, uh, those were all my, all my notes right here for you. All right? So we'll close with this. And we'll go ahead and we'll pray, and we'll take some communion today. We have communion coming today. Anybody can take communion that chooses to take communion that's a, a believer in Christ. If you're not a believer in Christ, you should not take communion. You know? And if perhaps if today you don't, you don't repent or you're not willing to, to forgive others in your heart of things, you shouldn't take communion either. But, but this is always a time, whenever you take communion, we gather together. It's a time to reflect on our condition, reflect on who we are before Christ, and repent. Repent right there. It starts right there. It starts right here. <coughs> repent right here. And if we repent right here, then it should carry through the other things. If they have some, some problem with somebody else, it should cause us to later go get with that person and tell them, hey, I'm sorry about this. Or, hey, you know what? We had this issue together, and I don't want to have the issue anymore. Okay? Even if the person wronged you, you've got to forgive them. Imagine how much we wrong Christ every single day, and yet he forgives us. There is nobody that we ought not to forgive no matter what has happened. And that's a very difficult thing. It's much easier things said than done. But when we do those kind of things, we will actually grow in Christ and be freed and not be kept down in the cage. All right? So we'll go ahead and pray. Bow our heads. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for each and every single person that's here today, Lord. Thank you that we're able to celebrate your resurrection, to hear this story about the two on the road to Emmaus and how they heard you explaining to them all these scriptures of the Old Testament of who you were, and then even showing them who you were and opening up their eyes, Lord. Lord, open up our eyes, Lord. Open up our eyes today and every day, I ask you, Lord, that we may have more light, that we may see more of you in our lives as we draw closer and closer to the time when we will die and meet you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you continually love us, Lord, and open our eyes. Give us a love and a passion for your scriptures. Help us to read them, Lord, for what they say. And not read into them, Lord, but to, but to really draw out all of the truth and all the light and the wonder that you have within them for us, Lord. 
Lord, I ask that you watch over each person here today, that you bless them this year, Lord, you bless them this week, Lord, that you enable them to share the gospel, Lord, as, as these two men on the road to Emmaus, they wanted, they traveled seven more miles all the way back the other way because they were so excited to tell everybody else what had happened, to share the truth about you. Help us to have this kind of passion in our lives, Lord, that we want to tell other people about you and share this truth. Lord, as we get ready to take communion, I ask you, Lord, that you help us to self-examine ourselves, that you, that, you, that you make us aware of what sins that we have in our lives, and Lord, help us to, to repent of these sins, to, to have the strength, Lord, to, to go beyond it, to go beyond what this secular, fallen world, this natural way of doing things would be, Lord, and to go above and beyond, to repent, to come to you, to forgive, and to allow you to be the one judge over all, Lord Jesus. We know that we cannot judge anyone, but that you are the master judge, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, to love our neighbors, to love those around us, Lord, and to love you with all of our heart, Lord God. Please take a moment of silence. Silence to pray.
that's what Easter is all about. Resurrection is all about. Good Friday. It's about the cross. It's about what Jesus did for us when He came and planned to do from all the way back in Genesis 3.15. It was already planned, is what we see. It was planned before that. God is perfect. He knows everything. There was never a time that God has ever grown. He's not like us, that we grow and we learn. He's always been perfect. From the beginning of time, and all that existed was God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The perfection was there. It's never had to change. It's never had to be more impressed. It's as perfect as perfect could ever be. And this was the perfect plan of God, to come and die for us. To break the power of sin that would cause us to be separated from Christ forever. To be hopeless without Him. And yet all we have to do is to believe on Him. We believe on Him. That's all we have to do. Believe on Him. And what does He say? He says, follow me. All right? If we really believe it, we'll follow it. Okay? If we don't really believe it, we may be of lip service like the Pharisees, but not really follow it. But when we follow Him and we believe it, we can know that we have salvation. All right? And we take this communion because we declare that we have salvation. We declare that He died on the cross for us. We declare that His body was broken for us, His blood was shed for us, so that He was our substitute. The only substitute that could ever come. You know, he went to, like, to the courtroom and pushed us aside after all the terrible verdict that sins <coughs> happened. You know, we'd be in <coughs> eternal hell is what would happen to you for your sins. And you're like, yes, I'm aware of all these sins. It's justice. And yet he took us aside and he said, no, I will pay the price for them. All right? And that's what Jesus did on the cross. So whenever we do this, we remember that the price is paid and paid in full. It's all by his grace. So we take this, and as we remember in Isaiah 53, another passage talked all about Jesus, it says that it pleased the Father to crush the Son, to break Him, all right? The Father was there the whole time, too. God was there. God is everywhere. There is no one that can ever escape God anywhere they go. God saw it, and it said it pleased Him to crush the Son. And, it, and Jesus said on the cross, He said, it is finished. What He come to do was done, paid for forever, all right? All sins paid for for whoever would come to believe on Him. And if you're blessed today to believe, then as we take this communion, we commemorate Him, we remember Him, that His body was broken for us. And we take this cup and remember that His blood was shed for us. Like it says in the Old Testament, the light is in the blood, you shall not eat the blood. Alright? But now, we drink the cup representing the blood, because it was all finished, all brought together with Jesus on the cross. Everything built up, all those Old Testament prophecies, everything that was focused on Christ was built up and centered on the cross that day. And he was resurrected and showed himself to all these people so that they would see, that they would know that the, the sign was formed. And we have all the history books and everything showing us, it's all it's telling us, and even our own hearts knowing that Jesus is the only way. And we take this, and we take this cup, a celebration of Him until the day that He returns. Because He surely, just as surely as Jesus came back then to come and die for us, He is coming again, the Bible says. And we can know that day is coming. And until He comes, or until the day that we die and we go and meet Him in the heavens right there, we'll proclaim Him. And doing this, we drink this cup. Now, I have a couple announcements. I don't forget. Alright? One... Is we have a lot of folks that have birthdays this month, and I believe there's probably somebody up there that we even missed a birthday for. Yeah. Maybe Jenny. I think she had a birthday too. But because of this, I bought a nice birthday cake. So please don't just rush out the door. Get a piece of this nice birthday cake I got. Okay. So we're going to celebrate some birthdays here. And then two, my other announcement I want to make is we have a uh, we have a, a potluck next week. Now we're kind of changing the name of potluck to social lunch because we don't want people to feel like they have to bring something and then they won't come or something. We want other people from outside to come to our church to hear the word, be part of the body of Christ. We want that. And we don't want them to think, well, if I don't bring anything, then I can't come. By all means. I mean, it's almost kind of like a catered potluck, okay? We have a whole bunch of stuff from potluck from one fella and then everybody else that brings potluck. We always have plenty of food. We, I've never seen a potluck we have around food. So... Plan to come out next Sunday and have a great meal with us right there, okay? And uh, you came and heard, now I ask that you go and serve. And uh, maybe we should sing happy birthday right here beforehand. How many people had a birthday this month? Raise your hand. 
We had uh, one little guy right here. We have one, one, one other younger guy right here in the front row. Tony had a birthday. Curtis did. And Jenny, too. So that's a lot of birthdays right there in one month. And, and it spans all kinds of different time, too. From, from nine years old to how old are you, Joe? Fifty? <laughs> well, I mean, we really spend some time right here, okay? Three quarters of a century. So let's let's go and uh, sing happy birthday to him. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Joe, Joe, Tony, Tony, Curtis, and Jenny. <laughs> happy birthday to you. All right. So come get a piece of birthday cake and thank, thank you so much for coming.